Welcome if you've just arrived for the afternoon session. Um, nice to see you again if you were here this morning. I, my name is Paul Handley. I'm the editor of the Church Times, and I'm delighted to be uh, here and, and, and grateful to the University of, of Winchester and the Cathedral here who have both been hugely welcoming to uh, us and to something that we um, are involved in this festival continue to call Bloxham. Oh, no, it's not anymore, but... Um, and the reason we do this is, is one of the reasons why this uh, is called the, uh, this is the inaugural Sir Tony Baldry Lecture. Uh, Tony Baldry was the, um, uh, he's been an MP uh, and uh, Second Church of States Commissioner, significant political mover for many years. Um, uh, two important things about him. First is that he lives in Bloxham, there's the clue. And secondly, he's a Church Times reader. Uh, and the story as he tells it is that he was reading the reviews in the Church Times and realized there was a, a whole sector of, of literary theological uh, enterprise uh, and endeavor that was not being celebrated. Um, and so the first festival of faith and literature, literature was, was uh, begun in Bloxham, uh, and the Church Times was invited and then in some strange way, which I have no idea how it happened, we, we sort of took over gently and, um, and now completely. Uh, <laughs> but Tony is still with us, thank you. And, and uh, uh, he's sitting here. I, I, I'm going to make you stand up, Tony, I'm sorry, just so that people can <laughs> see. Oh. Uh, um, but I have two int introductions, um, and the other is our, our, our lecturer. Um, uh, most of you seem to know him personally, judging by how difficult it was to get from the green room to here. Um, uh, Rowan Williams really doesn't need very much of an introduction. He has been uh, Archbishop of Wales, Archbishop of Canterbury, Peer of the Realm. He seems to be um, quite good at giving things up, but that's only, as I understand, so he can take up more things. Um, one of which is speaking here. Um, he, he continues to be um, an impressive uh, poet, theologian, academic, uh, and lecturer. So, Rowan, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, and thank you, Tony, for lending your name to this event. Thanks to all of you who have resisted the temptation to go and hear Mark Oakley. Um, I was very, very tempted myself, but I, I thought my absence just might be noticed. So here I am. And I want to speak about this issue of solidarity today, which is not, you might think at first sight, an obvious candidate for a festival to do with literature and the creative. But wait and see. I'll do my best to make the connection. The word solidarity probably evokes for many of us, including people of a certain generation, a generation quite generously represented in this audience, <laughs> probably evokes for us the history of Poland around the end of the 20th century. That great and very remarkable movement, popular movement, which was not only about workers' rights in the last days of communist Poland, but also about civil society, about the restoration of a critical, engaged citizenry in a country where the idea of critical engagement was not exactly at the top of anybody's wish list in government. And the name Solidarity, given to that extraordinary movement, was, of course, influenced by a very long political tradition of the use of the word Solidarity, but also by a more recent revival or renaissance of its use in a theological and ecclesial context. Solidarity forever, it's the union makes us free, as the old song goes, and the term solidarity first emerges as a powerful bit of political terminology in the 19th century, mostly in the anarchist movement, the work of people like Prince Kropotkin, and in that context, it's very much about what you might call the radical shared interest of certain members of society. 
Solidarity is the recognition of and the action on that recognition of shared interest. For you to flourish, I must flourish. When you are oppressed, I am oppressed. Recognising that and responding appropriately is what solidarity amounts to. Which is why, and it's a point I'll come back to in a moment, solidarity is more than just a fellow feeling. It's also profoundly something to do with how we make concrete and visible the reality of fellow feeling and shared concern. Within the 19th century context, it had a great deal to do with the union movement, a great deal to do with the anarchist ideal of the general strike as the ultimate weapon against state oppression. And it's still a term you will hear in the context of labor politics, labor with a small l. Not so much labor with a large l. <laughs> so there is that deep political hinterland. But by the middle of the 20th century, the word solidarity was being heard more and more frequently in the rather less predictable context of Roman Catholic social teaching. The first uses go back as far as Pius XII in the 1950s, but it emerges as a key notion, particularly in the writings of Pope Paul VI about social and international affairs, and even more visibly and more powerfully in the writing of Pope John Paul II. A few quotations from Pope John Paul II, especially from his encyclical Solicitudo Re Socialis, Concern for Social Affairs. There is, he writes there, no true peace without fairness, truth, justice, and solidarity. And in that text, he also reminds us that solidarity is not a vague feeling of compassion. Solidarity is a virtue to be exercised. That's from the late 80s, just before the solidarity movement began to stir in Poland. And it's hardly a coincidence that the most famous living Pole of those days had such an impact on the progress of the labor movement and its consequences through Solidarność in Poland in that era. But just over a, a decade later, Pope John Paul II was writing in 1999 about how dignity, solidarity, and subsidiarity were the three principles of a just society. Dignity, the recognition of universal human worth, every individual, solidarity, the recognition of an action upon that recognition of common interest, and subsidiarity, the willingness to think through society in a way which allowed decisions to be made cooperatively and effectively at the appropriate level of social organization. But Benedict XVI pursued the same line and quite early in his pontificate, in an address to the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, defines solidarity as that which enables the human family to share both material and spiritual goods. Exercising this virtue allows good to become common in society, both spiritual and material. So it's clearly a notion which has come into, into the spotlight in Catholic social teaching. To some extent, I would say it's rather displaced some older language about social charity. But very importantly, it's conceived in this environment, remember Pope John Paul II's comment, not as a feeling, but as a virtue, a conscious policy of moral identification, a conscious policy of moral identification, the recognition that your interest is bound up with mine, not necessarily identical, but that it is impossible for me to flourish if you don't. That's what we act upon 
And that means that solidarity recognizes the interdependence of what's good for human beings. That the pursuit of a good which is partial, partisan, based on one particular class, nation, group, whatever, is ultimately less than human. To refuse to recognize and act upon solidarity is in some sense a diminution of my own humanity. It's a refusal not only to give, but to be nourished by the interactive work, labor, vision of that world, human and otherwise, of which I'm a part. So the meaning of solidarity is not exhausted just by talking about cohesion. It moves, you might say, from cohesion to active mutuality. And thus, in a theological context, moves towards that notion which theologians call communion. There's some very interesting material on this in the writing of my mentor and dear late friend, Ken Leach. And some of you may remember that powerful collection of essays called The Sky is Red, which he published rather late in his life, where there is a lecture on solitude and solidarity, a very characteristic blend for Ken, who was nothing if not devoted to the inseparability of action and contemplation. He makes reference in that lecture to the work of an Anglican social theologian of an earlier generation, a rather neglected figure, Vigo de Mant, active especially in the interwar period, along with William Temple and others, and in the post-war period, ending his career as Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral Theology at Oxford, a writer whose work could do with revisiting and even republishing. And one of the things which Demant discusses in his work on this subject, which Ken Leach then quotes, is that it's wrong to think that solidarity is something which has to be constructed out of fragmented and separated units. To exercise the virtue of solidarity is to remove what is destroying something already alive. Our very humanity, though we don't recognize it nine times out of ten, our very humanity is involved in patterns of mutual living, giving and receiving. In all sorts of ways, social institutions of various kinds and patterns of power cut against, deny, or undermine that basic fact about our humanity. To exercise the virtue of solidarity is, you might say, to liberate something already at work if only we were able to recognize it. A mutuality of creative engagement. And that truly is written into the human enterprise overall. Then to exercise that virtue of solidarity is, like the exercise of every virtue, to liberate what is human from the inhumanity we have made of ourselves. The inhuman situation in which our habits of defense and acquisition and all the rest of it have trapped us. Another rather formidable social commentator from the Anglican context in the 50s and 60s, Valerie Pitt, remarked that to understand solidarity fully, we had to understand that the purpose of social action for justice was not simply about economic redistribution. It was about the proper and appropriate sharing of power in a society. Power in the sense of the capacity and the freedom to give what one has to give into the social complex, the social interaction. So again, it's not surprising that in another collection of papers, Kenneth Leach describes a moral politics in terms of finding the appropriate vehicles for lifestyle, identity, and supportive solidarity. Lifestyle, living in a way which is appropriate to our interdependence as human beings, identity, 
having our own distinctive gift and perspective liberated and listened to in that environment, supportive solidarity, the willingness to remove the obstacles to that kind of common vision, that vision of communion. Because communion, as the word is used, especially in Christian scripture, is very much more than just its original Greek meaning, where it simply meant having things in common, having uh, features in common. There is communion between Fido and Rover because they're both dogs. No, communion in the New Testament is precisely what the Holy Spirit sets free in us to make us more distinctively ourselves so that we may more distinctively give what is distinctive for us to give to one another. What only I can give is set free in communion. There's a very basic outline of how solidarity, the language of solidarity, has appeared in the political context and in two different but interrelated Christian contexts, Roman Catholic and Anglican visions of society in the last hundred years or so. And just to pause a little on definitions, it seems that we're being encouraged to think of solidarity as something distinct from three close but different visions of society and interrelationship. Solidarity, first of all, is distinct from communitarianism. It's not just saying that we find our identity and our welfare in well-running communities. In one sense, that's blindingly obvious as part of the challenge which we necessarily must put to particular kinds of individualism, but it's not simply communitarianism, more of that in a moment. Second, it's not just about the language of the common good, which once again is circulated and discussed quite a bit these days. And third, it's not the same as simply empathy, fellow feeling. In some of the writings that I've already mentioned by Ken Leach, he offers some sympathetic but very probing critiques of all these and shows that on their own they're inadequate without some leavening of this vision of solidarity. So, to take them in turn, communitarianism, the notion that I find my deepest reality and identity in community rather than the project of individual acquisition, gratification, or self-definition. That is all very well, except that it can also lead to an uncritical affirmation of the values and habits and power structures of the community you happen to be in. It can spill over into populism, into the tyranny of majorities, into stiflingly uncreative social patterns, simply accepting the forms of belonging that already exist. It's crucial for our human identity and well-being to understand our belonging. It's potentially rather lethal if the immediate and obvious forms of belonging are all that we ever think about. That way lie any number of exclusivist and ultimately toxic forms of social division and social oppression. There are communities, societies in the world which pride themselves on their communitarian vision and legacy. It's become very obvious in the last couple of decades how remarkably easily that vision can tilt towards xenophobia and exclusion. And if I can be anecdotal for a moment, I can remember a discussion over a dinner table in Denmark a few years ago with a young Danish politician who was in some distress and confusion about the way in which a political culture, which in Denmark has always been profoundly cooperative and communitarian, was more and more expressing itself in terms of naked and violent racism and a deep and sometimes profoundly violent response to migrants. What had gone wrong in the communitarian vision there that it had become so exclusive? It had become a vision for which belonging was only about the immediate obvious forms. <laughs> 
of that phenomenon. Communitarianism in itself can mythologize traditional forms of solidarity and collaboration and cooperation. It can idealize fixed models of that in the past. It can fail to recognize the deep ambiguity of the communitarian spirit in many social contexts where it becomes actively opposed to enterprise, creativity, and the rest. And having mentioned Scandinavian politics, I think it's also fair enough to mention the ambiguity of political cultures in our own country. The fact that there is in so many old industrial communities a profound awareness of solidarity and mutuality which can at the same time under certain social circumstances become repressive and hostile to any kind of difference, cultural, racial or whatever. It's what is sometimes being called a normative view of sameness. Belonging, which is simply about sameness, isn't quite what solidarity is about. And Ken Leach has some sharp remarks to make about how many bits of the traditional left, not least in the later 20th century, were quite astonishingly tone deaf on issues of gender as well as of race. What about the common good then? Is solidarity just about the common good? Well, here Leach and others would say the risk is always a kind of premature definition of the common good. We want a society in which what emerges in terms of policy and structure is good for everyone. Who exactly is involved in deciding what is good for everyone becomes a rather more complex question. And one of the least helpful tactics in politics as in other contexts is telling people what's good for them. To talk about the common good in a glib and easy way is failing if it doesn't look at existing collisions of interest. We might blithely say, yes, of course, as members of this society, we all have a shared interest. So why is it that there are specific collisions and conflicts? What's going on in those conflicts? And how are they to be managed, negotiated, and lived through in a way which is not destructive? There are real different goods for different groups. What is good for one group is not instantly and obviously good for all. And the reality of conflict is so often the reality of one group saying what we understand and believe is good for us is not necessarily going to be good immediately for our neighbour who is benefiting from the status quo. One law for the lion and the ox is oppression, as William Blake famously remarked. And common good is not the one law for the lion and the ox. But if the lion and the ox are actually going to live together without one of them devouring the other, no prizes for guessing which way round, there has to be quite an imaginative engagement with zoology in the interim. So common good is a project refined, articulated, expressed over time, through conflict, through the management and the intelligent thinking of conflict. Refusing, on the one hand, a simple standoff between your good and mine, which means I have to defeat you for my good to be realized, and on the other hand, a bland denial of actual granular difference here and now, the different agendas of different groups in different places with different histories. So if the language of common good, like the language of communitarianism, is not to be static, assuming that somebody knows what's good for everybody, before we start, there's work to be done. I think on both those points about communitarianism and common good, it's quite interesting to reflect on that most 
baffling of political conundrums in recent years, the Brexit debate. So often in that debate, we have on one side a bland assumption about the shared goods of existing trade agreements and relationships, and on the other, a deep sense of disconnection from political discourse and decision-making. Neither of those is in itself a helpfully critical or moral place to begin. Neither of those is a thought or understood position. And part of the tragedy of the Brexit debate and its aftermath, whatever you think of the result of the referendum, is a kind of coarsening and debasing of political encounter, a less thoughtful political culture, in that the self-evident goods of internationalism and the self-evident good of taking back power have not been thought through in relation to one another with an agenda at the end of the day of what might conceivably be a social settlement in which everybody was confident that their voice was respected and which didn't simply give way to a populist belonging philosophy which failed to ask critical and probing questions. And then the third thing, empathy. Back to St. St. John Paul II once again. We're not talking about fellow feeling. Empathy can be individualized, self-regarding. It can be about the absorbing of others into my experience. I know how you feel is not always the most helpful thing you can say to another person's suffering or another person's struggle. Empathy can prevent us seeing the real otherness of someone else's suffering. Once again, struggle and conflict are important. When somebody says in unacceptably shrill and hostile and confrontational tones that you're not listening to them, it's time to listen to them. And the sense that you don't have or you're not being granted an empathetic relation to them is in a way neither here nor there. The otherness of someone else's need and pain is indeed related to mine very deeply on any theological account. But it's not something which can be taken for granted by me without encounter, without listening, without perhaps conflict, without the staking of positions and the slow, painful labour of finding what might be livable with for all those involved. Empathy is effective only when it is not only the recognition of a shared interest, but also the risk of standing alongside someone. And solidarity as a virtue is of course in part about standing alongside those with whom we may not feel any immediate and instinctive empathetic involvement, but whose condition we recognize as critical, as demanding attention. Feelings of empathy are not enough. To use the fashionable language of our own day, the person who wants to be an ally has to be challenged and changed in this process and enabled to stand with the stranger, recognizing that the pain, the struggle, the confrontation that they are seeking to work through, recognizing that that is theirs, not mine, and yet I must stand with them in their difference, because only when that difference has been acknowledged and honored will I be free as well as them. And I think here of one of the greatest and most complex theological discussions of that in the last hundred years, the reflections in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's unfinished book on ethics, which he was still writing at the time when he entered his final imprisonment for his execution. In that fascinating set of essays and notes published as a book, but not entirely um, complete as a work, Bonhoeffer speaks of representation as part of the Christian calling and the Christian task, meaning by that that we are summoned to speak for one another in the sense that we stand with them, we take risks with them, 
we can for certain purposes make their voice our own and in all that process to learn how not to make our voice theirs. Representation is perhaps another aspect of solidarity in its full sense, but it would take me another couple of hours to slog through Bonhoeffer's discussion of this complex idea, so I'll spare you that. So, what positively can be said about solidarity when all of those caveats and complexities have been recognised? The three inadequate versions of social interaction and solidarity-based visions, the three inadequate versions that I've outlined following Kenneth Leach here, lack a full and robust sense of the active nature of communion. What I've talked about in terms of the flow of giving and receiving, the flow of life between those in a community, a flow of life between speaking, reasoning, arguing, imagining creatures is not simply the immediate self-evident recognition that you and I are the same underneath all our differences. Quite the contrary. The role of imagination, and this is where I finally find a hook to attach this subject to the literary and creative agenda, the role of our imagination here is to engage us with the otherness of the experience of other speakers, thinkers, agents, other cultures, races, and the rest of it, to engage us with that experience in such a way that we are, to some extent, silenced in our own self-preoccupation. And when that silence lifts, able to speak back to that experience of the stranger in a new way. And I've suggested once or twice that in thinking about solidarity as a social virtue, we should talk about the solidarity of speakers. We're all engaged in talking to one another. And the extraordinary act of faith involved in talking to other people is bound in with this active solidarity you are very different. You speak to me, nonetheless, expecting that I will recognise something that you're saying. I reply to you, indicating that I have recognised something that you're saying. But my reply is not the last word, because I will not have understood everything you're saying, by definition. And you will tell me so, with one or another degree of vigour. In what emerges from that, that process of painfully and gradually recognising one another more fully in conversation. Solidarity emerges. Not a solidarity which says, you are exactly like me, we have the same problems so we can easily do the same things. But the kind of differentiated, critical, laborious solidarity that says, we have a lot of talking to do to one another and a lot of listening. To use the word conversation of this can sound just a bit bland yet again, as if all politics and all social discussion were really a matter of seminar debates. But I am using the word conversation fairly broadly to include protest, political argument in a legislature, even mass popular movements which seek to change a situation by non-violent means. All of these simply because they assume that there is labour to be done in building a shared language and understanding. All of these are conversational in that rather broad sense. And this is where we come back finally to issues that are inescapably, at the end of the day, theological. Come back to the sense that the optimal or maximal form of human togetherness is a situation in which the flow of gift remains fundamental. A situation in which we are making one another alive in our diversity. 
the virtue of solidarity is not in ironing out the difference of the neighbour, but in honouring that difference and promising it the attention and engagement which will allow both of us to grow. And so a politics which depends either on an uncritical approach to community solidarity or an undisciplined vision of individual liberties needs to think again about speech. It needs to think again about what kinds of speech, what kinds of language between people are made possible or impossible by the policies and social strategies we adopt. We need a language for our common life that doesn't just reflect existing solidarities as we experience them, but digs more deeply to that level that Vigo de Mant spoke about, that inescapable interconnectedness at the root of our human being. And we need a language that doesn't just set up a series of rival and competing solidarities. A language that has some sense of moving towards a global and comprehensive situation of speaking to and listening to one another, which promises learning and growth together. And so in the central Christian image of the body of Christ, we are told, and St Paul tells it to us again and again, that the kind of shared human life God is building in us is a life which will always challenge existing accounts of belonging and solidarity, as from the very beginning the barrier between Jewish and Gentile reality was challenged, which will always tell us that there are further conversations to be built and further difficulties, conflicts and understandings to be laboured at, which will tell us that ultimately we can have confidence in the possibility of a universal human conversation because of the way we are made as speakers and listeners, as those to whom the word of God has been addressed. We exist as human beings because we are called into being, called into response by a word. And carrying as we do, so we believe as Christians, the image of God, we are attempting to speak to every other, a word which brings life, and to listen in every other for a word that offers life to us. That, I believe, is the solidarity which Pope John Paul II is writing about. That's the solidarity which I believe is a virtue, not just a vague convic conviction, a fellow feeling, a sense of togetherness. That's the solidarity which I believe can transform us and hold us in a vision of mutual respect, acknowledgement of dignity, and often conflicted and argumentative social unity. I've sometimes said in the past that I believe good democracy is necessarily argumentative democracy. And argumentative democracy is democracy which never simply says, we've done with that question and we move on cheerfully. On the contrary, democracy is really rather hard work if it's not to be majoritarian tyranny. The winner has to recognize solidarity with the loser. The winner has to recognize that in the middle and long term, their life depends on what we're now learning to call loser's consent in democratic process. It even has something to say to the processes of the church, I dare say, but that's possibly for another day. <laughs> Meanwhile, we are deeply in need of the resources not only of theology and liturgy in this respect, but of the world of the imagination and the world of the arts, which is profoundly and consistently committed 
to the strange but exhilarating idea that it's possible to understand strangers. Good art, great art, is in some degree strange to us. It inhabits and speaks from a world which is not just ours, which we don't already have in our pockets. That's why we return to it. We will never have seen the last definitive unsurpassable production of Hamlet. We will never have heard the last and definitive performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. There is something which continues to be strange. And engaging again and again with that strangeness should be, maybe, one of those things which strangely teaches us human solidarity by teaching us how to welcome the strange, how not to be panicked, silenced, crushed by the strange, but ask, where is life to be learned here? Entering on that lifelong and demanding program is, I would say, learning the virtue of solidarity as a principle for our society, our politics, and indeed our life as a Christian community too. Thank you very much. We have uh, about 20 minutes for questions. Now, I think I'm going to have to ask you to stand at the lectern so that the live stream can, can pick you up there. Um, Hello, live stream. Uh, we have two... We have uh, two roving mics, um, so if you have a question, uh, if you put your hand up, somebody will reach you with a microphone. And there's somebody up there, somebody coming down there. Um, while, while people are moving about, uh, can I ask a question? Um, uh, one aspect of solidarity that I, I, I use to separate it from something like a, a, from a, a, more, a closer relationship is... is is, is is actually that distance that, that that A can relate to B, but what about um, F somewhere down the line who relates to E, who relates to D, who relates mm -hmm. and so on? What 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 relationship is possible between A and F? That's a really interesting question because I think it <laughs> seriously because I, th I think it touches on the crucial fact that I'm always relating to a related being. I don't relate to you just as I see you now. You are who you are because of all the relationships in which you stand. You're not just there as, a, as a, an isolated atom, I, I take it. <laughs> and so, in one sense, the beginning of a good conversation with you will begin to give me a sense of what is feeding into your identity, your perspective, will give me a kind of incipient, inchoate relationship with those you're related with. It may make it possible in some other circumstances for me to relate more directly with those you're related with. Opens up onto that distance, I think, um, in, in that transferred way. But it does seem to me, and I hmm, can't overstate the importance of this, that whether it's with human beings or with the non-human world, we are always looking at a reality already in relation to something other than us. That which is out there and relates only to us. Well, you know, actually, that's a fantasy. There's nothing. There literally is nothing like that, even in the furthest reaches of Alpha Centauri. Somehow there is a connectedness in, in all of that and a healthy and life-giving relation to what is not me is that recognition that you are already in relation. And therefore, I don't own you as related to all those other factors. Ultimately, of course, you're related to God. Thank you. And so is everybody and everything. State the obvious. <laughs> right, we have a real question over in that top corner there. Thank, thank you, Rowan. I'm just noting that we're in a university whose roots are in teacher training for a very long time. Um, and I noted at the end of your speech, you spoke of learning and you've done it again. Um, there was a great debate in ancient Greece about whether virtue could be taught. Mm. I'm wondering if solidarity can be taught and asking, if so, what kind of higher education might be appropriate for that? 
Right. <laughs> How long have you got? Um, well, one of the short answers is, of course, not exactly the kind we mostly have these days. Um, so much of our educational system at every level seems to be predicated, and I gladly plagiarize, Nigel, your own ideas here, seems to be predicated on the idea of acquiring and owning stuff. Here is tradable, fungible commodity, knowledge or skill or whatever, and you know, you pass it up and you pass it around. And by the time you graduate, you've got a reasonable amount in the bank to, to trade. And the idea that real learning is something to do with the acquisition of that particular kind of language skill I was trying to feel my way towards, the capacity to listen intelligently and respond intelligently. I don't see a whole lot of that. And that reflects itself in forms of teaching which are mechanical and impersonal, where, again, to quote a phrase of yours, um, our relation to what is being taught is somehow corrupted and debased. Where on earth do we start with reforming our educational assumptions in all this is, is no easy issue because so much is stacked against it. And yet, I, don't know, I guess there must be a few teachers and former teachers in this audience, yet mostly when you talk to the committed teacher and the committed student about this, what they want is much more like the language skills rather than the package with the pocket. What is it exactly that prevents us rethinking our educational philosophy in those terms? Well, one answer to that, of course, is what you will find in Professor Nigel Tubbs's books. <laughs> I gladly acknowledge my debt here. But I think, I think, in all seriousness, there is a commodified, trivialized, short-term approach at every level of education shared by people right across the political spectrum, which I certainly think that anyone with any kind of religious commitment ought to be pushing back against really rather hard and rather consistently. Thank you. Um, uh, you have a microphone there? Yeah, do you want to come down here? Thank you. How can we, if, in, if we're pursuing solidarity, how can we prevent ourselves from feeling overwhelmed mm. by the, the task of solidarity the whole of humanity. Think of the suffering. I mean, just by turning on the news, seeing the scenes from Turkey, Syria, etc. Uh, yes. How do we protect ourselves from despair in the face of solidarity with so much suffering? That's another very penetrating question, I think, because people talk, don't they, about compassion fatigue. That's one of the issues that, you know, charity like Christian Aid, which I used to be chair of, had to, had to deal with in a sense. And that's where I think it's quite important to remember what Dr. John Paul says about this not being primarily about feelings. Our feelings are going to be all over the place, and we are going to feel overwhelmed by this. But to feel intelligently in relation to the suffering of others, to feel intelligently, that is to think the suffering, not just to be exposed to it, is to think, what's the engagement that is possible for me? And I can't solve 99.99 recurring percent of the world's problems. Is there, though, something which only I am capable of doing? Because I'm who I am with the perspective I have, the skills I have, even the income I have. And to recognize that the small act of engagement is intrinsically worthwhile because it is responding to what is real in our humanity. To treasure almost as sacramental, that smallest of steps. That's one way, I think, in which you sort of balance out the, the sense of utter helplessness, which I completely recognize here, and the, the sense that can lead us to shrug our shoulders and say, I'm just going to pull out the blankets. And Often when I'm speaking to, particularly to young people, about the environmental crisis, you know, very activist young people with lots of vision and energy, and I've, I want to say to them, 
you've got loads of energy and you're out to save the world in the next 10 years. But just remember, if you don't save the world in the next 10 years, you will have done something worthwhile by doing what you can do. And that's, that's not trivial. Thank you. Uh, is there another question on that side of the room? Or, oh, there's Some, another one here. There, oh, there's, there's, there's somebody yeah. waggling a finger there. Yeah. Can you pass the, the microphone along? Thank you. Thinking about the meaning of solidarity, um, you mentioned the shipyards of Poland. I grew up in the northeast of England, and you mentioned um, the industrial society there. I was very much in the middle of that, knew many of people. And it was a society full of pits, shipyards, steelworks, many other ancillary trades, people. Sunderland, where I came from, was full of industry. And it, although in, a, in a, a pit community, if you didn't fit in, you really didn't fit in. But they had a, a solidarity, which I think speaks to you, really, a shared enterprise. And our society has lost a lot of that shared enterprise. A shipyard had a variety of people in it, and they all lived together, but they shared one thing, the making of a ship. Having sat under the bow in a brass band once, as this huge thing went away from me once, and the sheer awesomeness of it, I appreciated what the people around me felt. So it's not just an academic thing. I think it's a product of an entirely broken society, and we need to get away from this neoliberal nonsense and get back to shared community and a really big shared enterprise. I've sat on engineering committees where we're talking about making something and I see real solidarity of the sort of thing that you're talking about. We're all different, but we all share the same vision. Thank you very much indeed. And I resonate with that a lot, partly um, coming from the South Wales Valleys the grandfather who was a miner in the upper Swansea Valley um, recognise everything you say about that. question then is, in the largely post-industrial society, what are the forms we now look for? And this is where I, I come back again and again to the, the crucial importance of national policies that encourage and enable real cooperative work at local levels, which encourage the participation of people in credit unions, in food cooperatives in school governing bodies, all those contexts where, as I like to see it, democracy is actually learned in that sometimes tough but creative engagement in making decisions and knowing that decisions are possible. So, yeah, we don't have, so to speak, the ready-made fellow feeling of the common enterprise of an industry that everyone shares in. We don't have that. We're not going to get it back in the short term. But meanwhile, that's not an excuse for just sort of locking our back doors. And to discover what can be done there to, I suppose, in many contexts of work, to see what kinds of incentive and encouragement can be given to people to volunteer in community work. That's the building from the bottom up, which I think we, we need to look at much harder than we often do. I think we have time for just one more question. There was a gentleman over here. Uh, in a society that increasingly, I think, tries to silence voices that we don't want to hear, um, do I always have the right to offend or hmm. a responsibility to be resilient to offence? Oh. <laughs> that's, that's the last question, is it? <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I have 45 seconds for it. <laughs> I don't like the language of the right to offend partly because it seems to me a misuse of the word right. I have a claim to do what I like is not a brilliant basis for a social vision, to my mind. That I have the freedom, which is a slightly different matter, to say things which may not be acceptable, yes. But in a culture that is working intelligently, collaboratively, I will, I hope, have internalized some of the risk of what I say. I will be learning some of the risks of what I say and be willing to say, you know, I had not heard it with your ears. I must think again about what I say. Now, I think a healthy and mature culture is one in which that work is going on all the time. And the trouble is at the moment when we have 
free speech absolutists on one side and institutionalized protective mechanisms on the other, we're losing confidence that our culture can resolve this. We're almost setting in stone the divisions of mutual incomprehension that trap us, and so getting ourselves into precisely the kind of, um, sorry, I don't mean to be rude about your language, but the sort of pointless standoff between the right to offend and the right to be protected. Um, we need to get beyond that, I think, and I despair of some of the nonsense talked about culture wars these days and some of the nonsense on both sides that, that can emerge here. Um, you know, given the choice between Jeremy Clarkson at one end and the recent editors of Roald Dahl on the other, I just want to bang my head against the wall and say this, <laughs> you know, this is really absolutely not how to run a culture. It's not how to run a whelk store, as they say. <laughs> On which point, um, I didn't, never thought we were going to be mentioning Welks today. Um, uh, I would like, on your behalf, to, to thank Rowan for this um, fascinating and intriguing um, series of thoughts, really, because it, it, it's, it's the sort of lecture that, that develops as one wanders off and thinks, well, what does... What was he saying? <laughs> what was that about? <laughs> um, and... Um, Rowan has a, a few minutes to um, to sign some books in uh, in the bookshop, um, but only a few. So uh, fairly soon, I'm going to try and whisk him through you, and without all the the personal greetings that Rowan seems to be able to <laughs> unable to move without. Um, so a very rude thing we're going to do. Um, uh, I understand that um, there was a mix up with. The, very few tickets, but a few people were sent to the cathedral for this session, and, and our humble apologies for that. It was um, uh, a mortifying thing to have happened, and if you could talk to one of the staff after this, and if that's happened to you, then, then reparations will be um, offered. Um, but Rowan, I'd like to thank you once again. Tony, I'd like to thank you once again, and um, thank you for coming.